Okay, so letter B, the fall of man into sin corrupted the world and everything in it. Uh, Taylor, I think you're out of luck and you're going to have to get some help from Emma uh -huh. uh, on filling this in. So we'll get you caught up. So, um, oh, I guess I need my Bible too. Oh, not nearly low enough. I know. I'm too old to bend down any farther. You made it out for the most part. For the most part. Okay, Ooh. so we've talked about how Adam and Eve sinned, how they hid from God, how he began to bring down consequences, first on Satan, then his consequences come to the woman in verse 16 of chapter 3. So the woman, he said, I will greatly in increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. So up until this point, having a child would not have been so traumatic and painful. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and every time I've taught this class with moms, they go, oh, that would be so nice. I mean, it's joyful for them anyways to have a baby, but to do it without pain would be fantastic. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, that doesn't sound like a curse, does it? Your desire will be for your husband. But that Hebrew word for desire is only used three times in the entire Old Testament. Once in a positive sense, way in the middle of the Bible. Twice right here in Genesis. Once in chapter 3, once in chapter 4. And in chapter 4, it's where one man is thinking about killing another man, and God warns him, and he says... Don't do it. He says, sin desires you. In other words, sin wants to control you. Don't let it control you. And, and so as I said before, men, when we're at our weakest, it's often when we're passive. We won't get engaged. We won't work. We won't talk. Well, here he, the, the scriptures tell us that, that for women sometimes it can be a problem is wanting to control everything. Wanting to always be in charge. Uh, and when you put those two together, it's a bad combination. Then he gets to Adam. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. And so, work up to this point had been a joy. Now, it's a pain. There's, there's problems in working. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. This is the big one. You're going to die. At some point, you're going to die. Adam, Eve, both of you. And ever since then, every human being has died. And so it's just a huge mess. Now, there's something very interesting that God does right at the end of this. If you look at verse 21, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Were they naked at this point? They sure weren't. Why? Because they had made for themselves coverings from fig leaves. They were not naked, mm -hmm. but God clothed them anyways. Why would he do that? Was it just an upgrade? <laughs> well, well, where do you get skins? Did God go down to Target and, or Macy's and get some clothes for him? Where do you get skins, Carter? Yeah, he, uh, he killed some animals. Killed some animals that had done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. They're just animals. They just do what they're programmed to do. But God killed them anyways. Why? To show Adam and Eve... When sin enters the world, so does death. And this is part of what you've caused. But the other thing he does is he's saying, by something innocent dying, your life is spared and you are covered. And these really point to Jesus, don't they? Jesus in the New Testament is known as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is innocent. He's done nothing wrong, but he dies in our place. The blood of Jesus covers us far better than any excuses we have can cover our, our sins and failings. And so God is pointing ahead. And then at the end of the chapter, the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Uh, cherubim is the plural of cherub. In the Bible, cherubs are not cute little angel babies that wear diapers and shoot little arrows. <laughs> if you actually met a cherub, you would probably die of fear. They're good. Um, they're called living creatures elsewhere in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. But they're unbelievably powerful. They are in God's presence all the time. And like I said, if we saw a cherub, we'd probably die of fright. And so God keeps Adam and Eve, he kicks them out of the Garden of Eden so they can't eat from the tree of life and live forever. It's, this is one of the saddest chapters in the whole Bible. 
you ever watch the news or hear about something and you go, why did that happen? I was, uh, I was uh, dropping my son off at school Monday or Tuesday this past week. And I, I went up to Missouri Flat Road and I was going down to, uh, to Home Depot before work. And uh, I saw a bunch of police cars. There was a sheriff's deputy vehicle and there were two or three highway patrol. And I thought, oh, it must have been an accident. I drove by and there on the side of the road is a body covered with a tarp. And one, one shoe is sticking up. You know, I can see one shoe. So I read about it in the news later, it was a hit and run. 87 year old man got, got killed by a vehicle that took off. That's really sad. Or you read about uh, you know, tsunami hits Indonesia and 4,000 people die in a tidal wave. Uh, we've had some people die in the east coast of the country just with all the storms we've had lately. Why does it have to be that way? This is why. Because Adam and Eve turned away from God and said, fine, no thanks God, we're fine on our own, we'll do it our own way. And every one of us after that has been born that way. When I was a kid, I was a pretty good kid, but there were times that my parents or a teacher would tell me one thing and I would do the other. Why? Or I would purposely try to get my brothers in trouble. Why? Because inside of me is this thing called sin, that's what the Bible calls it. And it's this, like Eve, I'm always thinking about myself. And uh, like Adam, I, I don't really want to engage if I don't have to. Right? So let's fill some blanks in. Um, i got a good glare going on here, right? So, uh, number one, relationships were broken. Remember, Adam looked at Eve, or he didn't look at her, but uh, he said, the, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some. So, you better believe that was not good for their marriage. Number two, creation was cursed. Remember how, uh, how uh, God says thorns and thistles are going to grow on the ground. And number three, oh, sorry, I've got a video. Get my volume up. Do we want to connect it to those speakers? I've tried that before. It's usually not necessary. If it's if it's not good, then I'll do it next time. You hear these statements a lot. Every day something tragic happens. A child dies. Cancer takes another life. An earthquake kills thousands. It forces people to ask the question, if God is loving and merciful, why is there pain and suffering in the world? Well, that's a good question. And thankfully, the Bible sheds a lot of light on this subject. Check this out. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the declaration of the very first verse in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. The next couple of chapters explain in broad terms what God made over the course of the six literal days he used to complete his creation. Light, the sky, plants, animals, and humans. That's right. God created everything, and according to Genesis 131, he saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. That is, it was complete and perfect. There was no death and no suffering. There was no survival of the fittest. Animals didn't attack and eat each other. Adam and Eve, the first two humans, did not kill animals for food. Genesis 1, 29 through 30 makes it clear that man and animals ate only fruits and vegetables. So the original creation was wonderful, peaceful, without death, full of life and joy, and all enjoying the presence of God, the Creator. So, what in the world happened? How do we get from there to here? Well, something drastic must have happened that altered the original creation, and that something was sin. Remember, God created a perfect world and placed Adam and Eve in paradise. As their Creator, He had authority over them, and in His authority, God gave them a rule. In Genesis 2.17, God said, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, Adam and Eve heard the rule loud and clear, but they willfully disobeyed it. They ate from the tree God told them not to. They chose to live by their rules and separate themselves from God. So the Creator kept His promise that punishment would follow their disobedience. With the rebellious act of one man, sin entered God's creation and death along with it. But the effects of sin didn't stop there. Because God had given dominion over all of creation to man, in a very real sense, the sin of man affected all of creation. In Genesis 3, we see the beginning of a cursed creation. Thorns and thistles were now part of the world, as well as pain and suffering and death. The world was no longer perfect. It was sin-cursed. And that's why tragic things still happen today. And before we give Adam and Eve the full rap, we have to realize that all of us still willfully sin against God. That should make us really pause and think. But for now, at least on this topic, enough said. I like those videos in part because I finally found somebody who talks faster than I do. Mm -hmm.
There we go. So relationships were broken. Creation was cursed. Man's fall was complete. We need a savior. We got problems. Uh, years ago, they came up with that commercial for uh, the first aid buttons that you wear around your neck, right? I've fallen and I can't get up. Well, here's a cartoon. Help, I've fallen and can't get up. Sin and corruption open year round. Every single human being is in that case. And understanding this makes a huge difference on how you deal with suffering and death in your life. For example, look at this guy. Uh, someone he loves died, maybe his wife or a child, and he goes, Some God of love you are. Why did you do this? It's your fault, God. Now that's if you believe God is responsible for pain and suffering. But if you recognize, wait a minute, I brought this into the world. I'm part of the problem. Uh, here he's quoting Romans 7, 24. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Absolutely changes the way you look at suffering in your life. You know, all of us suffer. Every single human being. And some of us suffer when we're young, some old, some in the middle. It's going to happen to everybody. Sorry to burst your bubble, but that's the way it goes. And so we had better have a handle on this uh, as, we, as we look at life. So what did God do about this big mess? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Remember Genesis 3.15? We read that. Someone's got to come and stomp on the head of the serpent. That's what Genesis 3.15 says. And so here's one artist's recreation. Uh, that God covered them with skins. The Bible doesn't say what kind of skin. This artist said, I think I'll make it a lamb because that reminds me of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But you can imagine Adam and Eve, they're now clothed with these skins of an animal and they're looking and realizing, that animal had to die for me. And that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. One of the most moving services for me every year is Good Friday because on that evening, I remember God had to die for me because I'm a wretched sinner. And it really puts things in a much healthier perspective. Uh, so who is Jesus? We're going to talk about him for a while. Jesus was God's solution to a cosmic dilemma. So God's got two, two parts of his character that seem to be at odds here. Let's take a look at them. His first, um, the first part of his character is his justice. Anybody know what the word justice means? Carter, what's the word justice mean? Uh, like... To make right? Yes, exactly. It's all about making things right. And so is God perfectly right? And does he always make right decisions? Of course he is. So his justice said, okay, there's sin. There must be. Death. There must be justice, right? That is what should happen. <laughs> and so that's how God uh, is in respect to his justice. But on the other hand, God's love called out for mercy. And so God is perfectly just, but he's also wonderfully merciful Oh, and so instead of getting uh, justice, we get mercy through Jesus on the cross. And we're going to flesh that out a little bit now uh, as we go along. So what, what can we learn about Jesus? Jesus' coming was supernatural. And all that means, the word supernatural, all that means is above nature. In other words, it, it goes beyond the laws of nature. Um, and so here's a drawing that's kind of confusing if you've never been like uh, exposed to stuff in the church this is supposed to, they, they, I bought this thing and it says uh, green pointer works on TV screens nope nope it doesn't so if we start over on the left side all this is is a picture that goes through the steps of what we call the Apostles Creed the Apostles Creed is a statement of faith so and I believe in Jesus Christ who was conceived by the Holy Spirit so we have a symbol of a dove the dove uh, symbolizes the Holy Spirit let me get over here so, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, we celebrate that at Christmas, suffered under Pontius Pilate, this is a Roman uh, flagellum, they would whip people with those, to me it always looks like firecrackers, but that's not what it is. So, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried, okay, uh, died and was buried, uh, when Jesus died the temple curtain was torn in two, there's his tomb, then he descended into hell, but this is not part of his suffering. Why is that? Because what did Jesus... Yeah, Carter. Uh, when he descended into hell, he was basically going down and telling the devil, hey, I won, you lost. That's right. And we know that because on the cross, right before he dies, Jesus says in a loud voice, we're told, it is finished. He doesn't say, I'm finished. He says, it is finished. My work, I've done it. I've paid for all the sins of the world. It is finished. And then he dies. His descent into hell, we're told in the Bible, he went to preach. There's different words for preaching. This is not the word for preach the gospel. 
This is the, the word to make an announcement. Just like Harp said, I've won. I did what I said I would do. Uh, so he uh, crucified, died, buried, descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. And some days he's coming to judge the living and the dead. And they have a picture of a sheep and a goat up there. Because Jesus tells a, it's kind of a parable, where he says, when I return, I'm going to be like a shepherd who separates the sheep and the goats. We'll talk more about those details. Yeah. But this is a summary. Okay? So here's, I have cartoons in here. Uh, here's the magi coming to find the, the, the young Jesus. It's around here somewhere. he got a flashlight. Typical man might be. If they had only they had GPS... <laughs> There's no woman to talk to. There's no woman to tell them how to get there. That's right. Okay, so what do we learn about Jesus? Letter A, Jesus is true man through the virgin birth. He actually had a, a, a mother. Her name was Mary. Number one, he grew in wisdom and stature. So Jesus had to grow up. This is one of the things I love. Jesus could have just shown up as a 30-year-old, right? Yes. But he didn't. He showed up as a, as a baby, as an embryo. I mean, Jesus spent nine months in Mary's womb, and he was born. And then he had to grow up, and I don't know, did the neighborhood bully pick on him? We, we don't know. But he had to learn to speak. He had to learn, learn to walk and all those kinds of things. Number two, he had a family. Uh, when you read in the Gospels, the people listen to him and they say, where'd this guy get all this stuff? Isn't his dad here and his mom and brothers and sisters? We know who this guy is. Who does he think he is? So he had a family. Uh, he got hungry, thirsty, had a real body. He wasn't some ghost or spirit. He suffered temptation, and he had human emotions. Uh, there's several times in the New Testament that Jesus is portrayed as crying. I've always wondered, kind of wondered why uh, we don't see him laughing. But I think he had such a burden on him. that I'm sure he did laugh at times. But he had such a burden for during those t years of ministry, knowing what was going to come. That's like pictures of Abraham Lincoln. That's right. But we know he had a lot of wisdom with. Yes, he did. In his writings. Yeah, I, I like to read about Lincoln, and uh, one of the books I've got says that he believed that he was going to die hmm. for some noble cause, even from a young age. He really believed that. So it's kind of weird. Now, so Jesus is fully human, but let it be, he's also true God with the Father and the Holy Spirit. How do we know this? He is eternal. Uh, sometimes what I can do on my screen here, instead of having us look up every verse, I can just click on it. So here's John 8, 58. He's having an argument with his opponents, and what does he say? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself. Why would they pick up rocks to try and kill Jesus? Pardon because they thought he was uh, blasphemy. Blasphemy, right. Blaspheming. So what, what is he saying there that, that sounds like blasphemy? Uh, he is God, basically. Like, well, he doesn't say, I'm God. What does well, he, he say? says, I am. And what does I am mean? I am is basically what God calls himself. Like, I That's am right. the I am. That's right. Yeah, so way back in the book of Exodus, yeah. God's going to rescue the Israelites. And Moses says, okay, you're sending me to Egypt and to the Israelites. Who should I say sent me? And he says, I am who I am. And so Jesus clearly is saying that, yes, I'm God. And they know this, don't they? They know this because they're picking up rocks. And so there are some critics of the Bible who will say, Jesus never claimed to be God. This absolutely disproves that. He did claim to be God. And so, going back to our study guide, he is eternal, before Abraham was, I am. He is all that. I don't like using slang in Bible studies because 10 years from now, even now, people are using this phrase. But, uh, again, let me give you the Bible verse. And this is talking about Jesus here. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers. So, what the Bible says about Jesus is he made everything. Who does that? Only God does. Number three, he has the authority to take responsibility for the sins of all people. All people. Only God can do that. Let her see. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Messiah. Now, different books will give you different numbers. Uh, but I've got, um, like, there's one chapter I was reading a book that said Jesus fulfilled at least 333 prophecies from the Old Testament. So here's a few of them. 
he would be born of a virgin. Who says that? Isaiah does. Isaiah, uh, the book of Isaiah was written about 700 years before Jesus was born. What does it say? The virgin will be with child that will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And what does the angel say to Mary? You're going to have a, a child. Or actually it's in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Matthew. And the angel says, and he will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. He would be born in Bethlehem. We all know Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Here's Micah. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Ephrathah is kind of like a county, like El Dorado County. But you, Bethlehem, in Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. So there's going to be a king coming. But his origins are from of old, from ancient times. That already points to who Jesus is. He's human, and he's going to be born. There's someone coming, but he's from of old, from ancient times, like God. And Mike is written about 500 years before Jesus was born. He would perform miracles. Isaiah again, 700 years before Jesus. Your God will come, then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. What kind of miracles did Jesus do? He opened the eyes of the blind. He helped the deaf to hear. People who couldn't walk went jumping around for joy, and, and so on. He did exactly these things. In fact, when John the Baptist was arrested and thrown in jail, he got discouraged. And he sent some of his disciples to Jesus, and he said, Are you the guy that was supposed to come, or should we wait for somebody else? Because he's in prison. And he's thinking, well, if the Messiah came, I, I should get out of prison, right? And uh, Jesus says to uh, John's disciples, Go back and tell him what you see. The eyes of the blind are open, the ears of the deaf are unstopped. He quotes from Isaiah 35. And he's basically saying, yep, it's me. He would minister in Galilee. Uh, let's see. Uh, in the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and, and the land of Naphtali. But in the future he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11:12. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. He was silent before his accusers. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet did not open his mouth. If you recall that account, the governor, the Roman governor is amazed. Why don't you defend yourself? You're on trial. Jesus didn't say a word. He was spit upon. Isaiah chapter 50. They pierced his hands and his feet. Psalm 22. By the way, when Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. He was crucified with thieves. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence. No broken bones. He protects all his bones. Not one of them shall be broken. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. Just read that from Isaiah 53. They cast lots, it's like rolling dice, for his garments. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. There's Psalm 22 again. He would rise from the dead. You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your holy ones see decay. Okay? Any questions or anything before we uh, move on to the next segment? Okay? You guys holding up okay, or do you need a five-minute break? We're good. We're good? We got okay. This. All right. So, the names of Jesus reveal both his power and his purpose. We're going to look at the names that, is, is, uh, that were used for Jesus. Number one, Jesus Christ does not equal John Smith. So those of you who like math, you get to enter your does not equal sign. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. <laughs> so Jesus actually is a name. It is his personal name selected by God himself. And it means Savior. And so uh, in Hebrew, it would be Yeshua. In English, we'd say Joshua. So Jesus was named Joshua or Yeshua. In Greek, when, it get, when Yeshua got translated into Greek, it came across as Jesus, and that's where we get Jesus from. Christ is not a name, it's actually a title. Christus. It means the anointed one, or the chosen one. And in fact, the, Greek word, or the English word Christ and English word Messiah come from the Greek word Christus, which means anointed one, and the Hebrew word Mashiach, which also means anointed one. So Christ and Messiah mean exactly the same thing. They're just coming from two different languages. But to be the anointed one, for example, who would you guess in Old Testament Israel would be anointed? What kind of people? Rich people? Nope, not rich people. A priest. A priest would be anointed, yep. Mm -hmm. Who else? A king. 
king. Dilly, dilly, yes. Uh, a, a king would be anointed. So they'd anoint a, a king. So uh, a prophet, a priest, and king, they would all be anointed. And, and what is Jesus? He is our prophet, our priest, and our king. He is the anointed one. Now what did Jesus do? So we know who he is, right? And I know this is going fast, uh, covering a lot of ground. Uh, again, you guys can help Taylor work through this stuff. Um, but So we know who Jesus is. He's both God and man. He's the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. What did he do? Jesus suffered and died in our place. He took our place. Remember God's got his sense of justice? you got to do the right thing, right? So if, if uh, someone does a terrible crime, does there need to be punishment? Yeah, how would you feel? What, what do you think is the worst crime someone can commit in our, in our society today? Rape and murder. Rape and then murder, yeah, especially if it's a child. I think if, if someone were to commit a crime like that, that's about as low as you can go in, in our culture today. Can you imagine if, if somebody did that and they, the police caught him and uh, they do the trial, right? And, and he says, I, I don't want a jury. I want a, I want a judge to decide my fate. So they do the whole trial and... They finish the trial, and so it's time for sentencing. And the judge says, okay, well, we have DNA evidence that places you at the scene of the crime. Um, we have eyewitness evidence that saw you leaving such and such a place with the victim. Uh, you have a pattern of this behavior, this type of behavior before. But you said you're really sorry, so I'm going to let you go. What do you think would happen? He would do it again. There, well, I think there'd be a lynch mob. <laughs> I don't think he would do it again. I think he'd get killed. And probably the judge, too. Because we would all be outraged. It's obvious the person is guilty. He's stone cold guilty. He did this terrible crime and murder. He deserves to die, or at the very least, have a life sentence with no chance of parole. And the judge just let him go because he said he was sorry? That would be so wrong. And, and so when we look at humanity and the crimes that humanity have committed, the lies we have told, the hurt we have caused, the murders we have committed, on and on and on. There's no way that God can just go, well, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. What kind of a judge would that be? A lousy one. And so, um, for God to have justice satisfied, he can't just say, I'll just pretend it didn't happen. And so somebody had to die. The wages of sin is death. death. And so Jesus did that for us. So he suffered under Pontius Pilate. Now I'll tell you, um, I like to, in this class, talk about how people used to question the Bible a lot, and they still do. But there were people who said, you know what, Pontius Pilate never existed. Because the only record we had of him was in the Bible, and that was true for many years. But then, I believe it was in 1961, they found this. Right? Now, what is this? This is part of a building. It's a dedication stone for a building in a, a town called Caesarea, which is on the coast of the Mediterranean, west of Israel. And uh, I underlined there some words. They're, they're a little bit, you know, damaged over here. But here you can read very well. It's capital Latin letters. It's Tiberium. And so that ending, Tiberium, means two Tiberias. And then underneath here you can, you can read out T-I, that's a U, T-I-U-S, P-I-L-A-T-U-S. It's Pontius Pilatus, Pontius Pilate. Wow. It's a dedication stone. Yeah. Uh, Pilate dedicated this building to Caesar Tiberius. Uh, and, and he signed it on a rock. So, uh, as, as I like to say, this is hard evidence that Pontius Pilate actually... I know I'm rocking the jokes. This is hard evidence that Pilate actually lived, and, and the Bible is absolutely accurate. So as governor of Judea, only Pilate had the authority to deliver a death sentence. Sometimes the Jews would have a riot and they would stone somebody... In fact, we read about a guy named Stephen in the New Testament that happened to him. But they weren't supposed to do that. If there was ever a capital case, they were supposed to only go to the Romans. They were the only ones who had authority um, to do uh, the death penalty. And so that's why Jesus was brought to Pilate. Uh, because the Jews didn't have the authority to crucify or, or execute anyone. So what happened? Pilate chose to crucify Jesus in order to protect his career. So let's take a look at that. If you would open your Bibles to John chapter 19. That's going to be on page 1070. 
And here we have Pontius Pilate, and he's got Jesus on trial, and he can't find anything that he's guilty of, because there was nothing. So if you look